just this morning I was reading in the hotel. Most of you know that Amar Bose died. Yes. Of Bose Electronics. Great guy. And I was looking at this and it's really amazing in view of the discussion we've been having in the board meeting yesterday and this morning with faculty and staff. In the 2004 interview in Popular Science, this is what he said. I would have been fired a hundred times at a company run by MBAs, but I never went into business to make money. I went into business so that I could do interesting things that hadn't been done before. A perfectionist and devotee of classical music. A lot of that sums up the subject which we've been talking about the last few days about leadership and issues of which you have enough lectures. I'm going to make this your question. You're going to do most of the answers. And I'm just going to ask the question around the framework, which I just put that up there. You won't be able to see from the back, but don't worry. You have three groups in this room, I believe. You have the business, the leadership. I call you the de designers. You have the marketing people here. I call them the deliverers. And then you have a large HR group, and I call them the conscience keepers. So that's easier for me to understand. And that's the way so the designers, the deliverers, and the conscience keepers. When you move forward in soil, you have to understand the question which we're going to put to you is how would you structure soil? How would you see it grow? You've got the passion of soil up there and, and, and up there. You're not a B school, we've all been told that the whole day. So then, what are you? So then I thought, let's ask them simple questions. How are you led? How are you taught? And how do you learn? These are questions which I request you to answer by yourself because I want to go through this very fast and then leave it open to really you. So how are you led? How are you taught? And how do you learn? My answer to that is the school of inner learning, which is a small soil. School of inner learning. I put that down. So S O I L. And suddenly the small soil of inner learning explodes into your soil through experience and experiencing. The two are slightly different, and I'm sure you I don't need to elaborate on that. But that is also a background. Then I thought a structure three. To give you a quote from Peter Drucker, who's now passed away and gone, but it's an amazing quote, and I'm sure most of you know it if you've done or, or, or read it. He said, the purpose of business is to find a customer. Have you all heard this quote that I made? Without a customer, there is no business. Therefore, a business has two functions, and only two functions, marketing and innovation. And now the punchline. The rest are costs. The rest are costs. Uh, repeat that. The purpose of business is to find a customer. Without a customer, there is no business. Therefore, a business, and you can apply this to soil. Soil is a business. Has only two functions, and only two functions, he uh, repeated. We learned this when we were in our 20s. Um, marketing and innovation. And then he left a gap in his book and he said, the rest are costs. And that statement, if you think about it, is very, very deep. It just shows you, and this could apply to soil, it could apply to Mahindra, it could apply to any company that you can think of. So, now this is your session. How can you work on soil, which its inner conscience can deliver its purpose? We've had debates at the board level. We've had talks with some of you, from the staff. And there have been all sorts of things about what student expectations are, the structure, etc. The fact that most people come from IT and they don't want to go back to IT, some want to go here. There. So there is this very simple, if you imagine a seesaw, there is the en en enrollment on one side of the seesaw and placement on the other. And if the enrollment and the placement is at a flat level, if the seesaw is totally flat, it means if you have 108 people on board as a 
with 100 million people are placed, you're fine. The problem comes when the seesaw is not flat. I would like to just somewhere, not now, to look up a thing called Planet Campus on Google or whichever search engine you use. Just look up Planet Campus. And now, I want to come to the subject of your industry, your business, which is the business of, of education. You open any newspaper anywhere in the world, here in India, wherever you travel, most of your uh, all over the place, and you will see something on education, a supplement, a new school being opened, pictures of boys and girls playing basketball, etc. It's, a, it's become almost every day you see it, all over. So it's a high growth industry. In fact, if there was somebody <coughs> from private equity, he will tell you that, uh, and I chair a private equity firm called Milestone, he will tell you that there are two growth areas where the IRR is 30% plus, and that is the education industry and the healthcare industry. And that's not rocket science. It's well known. And yet, despite this huge growth, everyone talks of a gap. You ask people in industry, you ask people when we are on the on, on the recruitment side, and this was even this is not just yet, this is at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cambridge, Judge School, or wherever you go. They talk of a gap. And this gap is what? The gap is what the education delivers and the expectations of, of the employer. And McKenzie, the consulting firm, has gone on record to say that in the last six to seven years, this gap has become wider, not narrow. So on the one hand, you have a supply a situation with campuses opening all over India. Some of you may know that in the last what, three, four years, 18 leading American institutions have opened campuses in China. <coughs> the last one was just a short while ago. Thunderbird, some of you will know, have heard of a Thunderbird. A Thunderbird used to turn out about 1,800 MBAs. Last year they had 212 applications. So you can just imagine the drop in their revenues. So then these, what are these institutions doing in the world of education? They are allied with the business partners to take campuses into countries like China and Singapore and Australia. We of course have a restriction here in India. We have the, the Foreign Education Act has not yet been passed, so they haven't come here yet. But what if they do? All these questions you have to answer as students of soil, as people who have experienced soil, because just as there are all over. Because somehow that gap between what the postgrad comes out with and the expectation of the employer, somehow people feel this gap could partly be closed with a subject which is not explicit but tacit. And I'm sure you know the difference between a tacit strength which you have and an explicit strength. Most education, especially in the non-humanities, in the IT sector, is fairly explicit. Are some of you aware of the McKenzie model of three types of work? The first type being transformational, where you take iron ore and you make steel, it's called manufacturing, you take wood and you make furniture. The second one is transactional. It bucketed work into three verticals, if you like, or, or buckets. The tran transactional is what we in the old days used to call clerical. Bank services, in insurance, trade, partnership, everything which involves the old-fashioned word, clerical. The third one, which also begins with a T, and one in which McKenzie, when they studied and did this over 10 to 12 years, is the tacit dimension. And which 
creates the most value of the three? The last one, because it has no raw material cost. Tacit dimension is the unexpressed value which gets created by human beings gathering all together and not uttering a word. The biggest example is, of course, a newborn child, the mother, or brother and sister playing in school, etc. And we have all experienced this. There is a hidden energy which suddenly emerges. And the Mackenzies are trying very hard with Bain and the others and BCG. They all jumped in, in, into the game now. How do you exploit the tacit damage? Again, the way of closing that gap between expectations and what's there. Then, all of a sudden, and not all of a sudden, but it's been there for some time, but it suddenly has the reason is the dialogue which now between customized education between you and your laptop, the Khan Academy, e-learning, Corsa, um, edX, Harvard, MIT, the Bodleian Library at Oxford, they all put the knowledge online. So the role of a teacher becomes a facilitator. So it enables the short supply of teachers to be stretched over a much wider dimension. This is an asset, but it can also be a threat. And we're talking here again of soil, and the way in which you can respond to this once I, I shut up and sit down and, and, and you do all the talking, is here again you have, first of all, the overseas colleges wanting to enter here, you have, you have e-learning, you have the gap, and it's exploding. I think Corsa, if I'm not mistaken, or Corsa has 800,000 students in eight months, nine months. Students of a high level. This is not. Courses in history, art, sciences, biology, geography, all over. Those of you who have accessed this will be surprised at the richness and diversity of e learning programs. I have a grandchild in Australia, so I go there. And because it's a large country, very large, and there are no people, there's just no people, it's the loveliest place in the world to go if you like being alone. Is e-learning there is a matter of course, because there are no teachers to fly out. There are no, the small schools of maybe 10 people, 12 boys and girls, in a settlement somewhere. And they're used to right from the language, and it's going to catch up. It's on the scene and it will happen here. Yeah. Then comes something which, do some of you know the McKenzie Global Institute? Have you accessed them and their, uh, their uh, reports? It's free and it's available. We've been talking about it the whole morning with your staff. The MGI, as it's called, they bring up their reports, I don't know, once a year, twice a year. The latest one, and this, I mean, is really very interesting, is disruptive technologies. It's dated May 2013, so it's not so long ago. It's a huge document. You don't have to read the whole thing. Just read the first 26 pages. It's a summary of what business will look like, what academia will look like, what employment will look like. And the fear is that this gap will get even wider. And it is not a question of fact. But do get into the habit. I would strongly advise you, particularly because you have that background of soil with the diversity, sustainability, ethics, mindfulness, is to look at what a disruptive technology can do to the world of learning, the world of seeing, the world of sensing, and to happen very quick. Those of you who have kids of 8, 9, or 10, and they have an iPad, you all know what happens with them. <laughs> then, there's something which from this I also began to notice. My friends in Germany and Switzerland bought a lot of them because Walter's parent was the Volkers of Winterfell, so those old links remain. Why is the rate of unemployment in Germany the lowest in the world? amongst the Western countries. It's 
2.5 percent, 3 percent, something like that. Spain is 16, the UK is 14 percent, USA is 11, 12. Why? Like they had the same problem, the gap, they have all the rest of it. The German system of education, and this was really interesting, is you cannot get a degree or a certificate of the type you have here unless you have done an internship in a manufacturing venture. And manufacturing is defined widely. So it's a double barrel training. It's peculiar to Germany and Switzerland and I think Canada, somebody said earlier on in the day. And this again has taken a sudden spring up. People have begun to realize that perhaps if they add vocational training, and don't take vocational training in the narrow sense of the word, they take it in the much wider sense, it makes them close that gap partly and there's been an explosion of this the data group itself is into this in a huge way and you'll hear more about it. So what do employers really seek? I tried to put that down in simple terms. I'm not an MBA and I haven't had the or hadn't had the or hadn't had the opportunity to go to an institution like soil. So but it's still the first thing I think is, and we see this when we are interviewing, adaptiveness to change and ambiguity. They want people who are very comfortable with this. In fact, in AFCOMS, which is one of the Chatterjee part of the group companies, they call their young trainees, well, they're not so young, they call their high trackers, fast trackers, the early adapters. That's a phrase and a buzzword which they have started using. And, and, and other people. <coughs> Values and ethics are increasingly under stress. Huge. With no idea of the burden. In our time, we didn't have an issue with values and ethics. Nobody would bribe us. We were longing to be bribed, but no one would bribe us. So, but now, take shortcuts to achieve targets and goals. The best of companies, the highest values and ethics are under stress, are under pressure. So they're looking for people, Joel Mehregani, the person just with no move or step when it comes to value and ethics. The ability to cope with diversity, and diversity is not gender balance, that's just one part of, of, of diversity. It really means people who think differently. And we were talking this morning with your staff about a company called Schumacher, which is a wireline company, some of you would know those of you who are in the oil and gas field. Schumacher, and it's the world leader in its field, mandates that every crew on its oil and gas platforms, and these crews are very highly paid people, these are not crews in the sense of people who turn spanners and uh, logs. These are people who run very complex IT systems. For the wireline, that is when you drill an oil well, you case the well, you send in the wireline equipment, it senses what the well is and then you drill and you, and you exploit the well. They're mandatory that they will be one nationality, they will be at least five nationalities per rate. Because long ago, and it's a French firm, long ago they began to realize that in the oil and gas exploration, they will not be able to send Frenchmen out to China, to the South Seas, to <coughs> coast of Africa. And for them, if you look, if any of you have access to, and I've given these leads to your staff, to the personnel manual guides of Schwimbezer, it's idle to in diversity, is something which we're talking about now at great length, but they've been doing it for quite some time. And the benefits of it are clearly seen. Again, there's going to be a huge amount of pressure. We in the Walters also now have stepped off the board and I have retired. But I remember when we took on iconic projects, we did the Singapore airport, we did Hong Kong airport, we did Singapore water treatment plants on it, we did the Al Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Wherever the project had been in, we recruited them from Poland, Romania, Australia, retired people. As long as they spoke English, that's all we really needed. If they were not those people, this huge gap again. So, diversity, 
we have to handle that. You have to live and work with people as you get older. And you have to look in to see whether soil has actually done this and made you more comfortable. It's not just with the gender balance. A lot of people use that term for male and female, but it's a lot more. It's people with complete diverse views of how things should be done and led. And then, of course, the one which all of you will have no problem with, to be technically savvy. That is not an issue as far as all of you are concerned. If you look at academia from the 1960s, and when we grew up, we had no MBA schools, we had no mentors, no coaches. That all, all of this has come much later. If you looked at the type of education, it made you capable of working either for the government or an institution like the government or the corporate sector. By and large, they were only two sectors. And, I mean, unless your father was wealthy enough and you had your own trade or the business, but that's gone. That is now completely changed again. And again, the education system, even in the corporate sector, which most of you will probably enter, will have changed a lot by the time you come back into the corporate field. So you have business models, which are then satellitic and not monolithic. In our time, it was very simple. Because man, if you had R&D, manufacture, going up the line, and then you went right up to the top or the near top. Now, the business models, which are happening more and more and more, are satellitic, they're ever-changing, they're like a jigsaw. You go on changing them all the time, and therefore you have to deal with this. And again, to come back to diversity and ambiguity. So these are the challenges which I want to summarize, which will face the and it will be nice to hear how you, what your views. You've heard the view of your staff, you've heard the view of the board. But before I close, then you have lots of time, or oh, not so much time. Why do I put B2B and F2F? The B2B is not business to business, obviously. And here I must tell you a story of a person who I admire endlessly. I started my life with him. Mr. Hoklas and Lassen Dubro. He passed away. Uh, 1997, around there, 1995, 1996. He'd come to my home <laughs> in Kandala which is near the new LNT Trading Center. If any of you are from that side of India, you will know this campus. It's huge. It's enormous. It's like an urban, it's like a city in itself, <coughs> in, 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 in the hills. And he walked around with his stick and all the executives and said, no, you must write something on the board. You might. He was a very humble man. He said, I had a dad 30 years ago. I don't want to write it. He says, fine, I've seen it and I'm going to pay the insistence that you write it. <coughs> I can never forget this. He took the magic stick and he went on the board and he said, Larson Tubro has developed a lot of brawn, P-R-A-W-N. It now needs to develop a brain. And then he wrote, B to B. From brawn to brain. And he was so right. Larson Tubro was a contractor, which is brawn muscle. Lots of engineers, lots of people, they could take on jobs. But for processes, they had to lean on the Italians, the Spanish, what I mean, Korea, Chinese, etc. Especially in the oil and gas stage. They couldn't give you A to Z. Now they can. That shift was the B to B from brawn to brain. And that would happen across all sectors. The knowledge in the business, at some point of time, will be worth more than the business. I wonder if you can grasp that. The concept, and those of you who have been doing strategy, will be able to see that. And then, what's F to F? Everybody in that room, and the old man, was forecasting. Last in Duro, in 10 years, will be 18,000 crore now. 60, 20, 25, the old man was shaking his head. He said, no, no, no. Please tell me how Larson Tubro will be 
10, 15 years from now. And we forecast this. <coughs> and then that's the last thing he said shortly after that he passed away. From forecast to foresight, which is very different. I can never forget this, and I always pass this on when I talk to younger people. That from brain, from brawn to brain, which is increasingly where you will have asset like structures, but knowledge intensive, and when the ability to forecast will be what the average MBA will do, but what a soy student will probably be able to do is to foresee, because the skills which you people have here, the broader skills which you are going to adjust with and grow up with, will be more of foresight. Forecasting is easy. Foresight to see what's around the corner goes back to the McKinsey Global Institute, go back to the tech, tech, tech technologies, go back to that sense of the gap, and you will see how foresight and companies which don't have foresight, the shelf life of a company of 50 years is now down to 15 or 20. And that's the thoughts I want to leave you with. Now, what's the answer? How do you get soil on the future? Go ahead. I believe most of you are students who of students, not in the sense of the student design standard as an undergrad, but you've been working, you've left working, you've come back to widen the, widen the horizon in a sense. So, where are the expectations? How does soil sustain itself in the turmoil in which the world of education has gone? And what's your answer to that? We've had an answer from faculty, we've had answers from staff, and we're very interested for some of us to see your answers. How do you arm yourself? You don't want to be an MBA, that's been very clear. Everyone says we are not an MBA, we are not an MBA school. Yeah. Now, coming future as we see, it's going to be a knowledge based society in the coming future. So, in soil, along with the skill pillars, as you have said, it will actually, the value system. Uh, of the Indian society as well as the whole humanity, if we take that along with the building up of the knowledge, then I think uh, for sure uh, soil students can be an asset for for the world. What special edge? The special edge is uh, if you are uh, going to study here as we do, uh, we have to develop uh, the aim of soil is multiple intelligence. So if we try our hands on different type of stuffs, I think. Uh, it's just that if any work is given to me, I should be able to do that. I should be the solution maker for things. You know, this so is, you yeah, if I in one domain to be domain neutral. Change makers, as you said, uh, you should be uh, very adaptive to the changes that come up because uh, every time business and the whole society is changing. So I think we need to be really, uh, we should take everything up front, prepare for it. What and should soil do to do that? Soil. Uh, What does soil need to do? As a community, we will have to develop more. As the whole soil family. Because I think that the more we learn from each other, and uh, the soil, I think, soil, what, is, what soil is doing right now is, is, is good in, in itself. Uh, what soil students and should do more is to build a better community and better coordination among each one of us and try to share more. I think uh, students will uh, can make up the soil do better. Somebody has passed it down the line. Give the poor boys a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I wanted to talk about F to F uh, in terms of uh, how that could really help the future generation to look at different things. F, F to F, which is forecast to uh, foresight. foresight. So primarily what is happening is, uh, it might be the grand generations or the uh, education system is all focusing on the actual problems that is present and we are trying to uh, address that. Right. Rather the generation to come and the, generation, the current generation should focus on the future problems and then build up solutions. So that is what I want to say. How do you develop foresight? Anticipating problems. The, the create, that, that's where the creativity comes in. That's where you uh, look at a long-term perspective in terms of... Uh, why are we problems? Foresight. 
environment problems, why not shapes? Uh, I'm using as a, a, a problem that could be the foresight, as you said. It's more what does the change that it's not just the current, the current things, but in terms of what change has been uh, looked at in terms of the foresight really means the best way to really do it is you drop all assumptions, you empty yourself, and you start from scratch. Look what's happening in the pharma industry. Chemical bound entities have entered two pharma industries, not sure if there's another one, and I work with one. Your chemical entities which you take either orally or in injectable form or topically, in a little while it will be a thing of the past. Stem cell research, enzymes, biotech will really come in. So would you invest in a new bulkhead plant? Would you invest in a new steel plant? That requires a lot of So it's for Foresight is really saying, I'm naked, I'm naked of all assumptions, and I want to see what's moving this world, what are the technologies which are driving it, which suddenly arise. Look how quickly Apple has become, you just have to take the pill, there's one Apple. I can't go out with my granddaughter in Sydney if I have an i3 anymore, I have an i5. I mean, that's just humor. But Something is happening. So foresight is it's very difficult. It's not easy. But it means emptying yourself. But really. Start, I think, uh, more and more of research and development has to be uh, huge. 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 Amount of reading. Reading. One of the things, and, and Anil, I'll share this with you, working with your people the whole day. I requested them all, they must read a little more. They must know what's happening in the world around them. What's happening with the large companies, the small companies, what's happening with people, what's happening with emotions. And that can, and now that it, it's all there, it's on the net, it's on your books, it's on the paper. But people are so busy in their life that they don't have time to just read. So access to reading, the knowledge, the art of life, if you like, is what will be ability to foresee. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. The mic's too far from you. <laughs> uh, as it is said that we are not MBA students, but we are leader, leadership students. So I think in uh, today's world, you are what, here. Business. No, leadership. marketing. Oh, you're here. Yeah. Delivery. Yeah. Okay. So it's like uh, I think what will differentiate us from the others is uh, when we, uh, like in today's world, there are uh, people who have been doing many unethical things and all in the industry and they are really uh, making a bad name for themselves and the institute. If we continue uh, following these five pillars and perform on that, then that will make us different and in long run also will make soil different from others. So what you're saying is, and it's a very interesting, how does soil become the defining educational institution in the space in which it is chosen for itself. What's the defining need? The need of the art. How do you how do you become a defining need? You become the defining standard. It's not best practice, it goes beyond best practice. This phrase of a defining company was brought about I think five, six years ago when that Indian head of Pepsi, Nui, she reused this phrase that I will make Pepsi in three to four years the defining health foods company and health drinks company. And the share market tumbled, crashed, etc. All that thing happened because they took the sugar out of Pepsi. It didn't matter. They stayed the course. But they want to be the defining company in that space. So if you want to be the defining institution in your space, what would you need? What would you advise soil faculty to do? What would you advise soil staff? Sorry. You need to live by the values that you portray. That you, oh, you have to walk the talk. Absolutely. I believe that uh, in the find the standards, we need uh, just not walk the talk in the sense we need more entrepreneurs who can show that this is possible. 
change makers in terms of entrepreneurship. That now you've come to another very interesting subject. Yes. <coughs> now in that entrepreneurship. part. Yeah, entrepreneurship and crucible of learning. And it, it, it will. So what is a patent? What's the truth in art? Is the three D printer the truth? The art is the truth. Very interesting. It is. It's about the ability to build crucibles of learning, crucibles of passion. So I think it can work in two ways for soil. Uh, as in uh, Indian school, if you can, <coughs> it's a need of the art. Everybody is going up to this like EPJ is saying it for the last 10, 15 years now that we need more entrepreneurs. So it can serve that. And working in, in a freedom or a creative freedom to work in a high-end technology area, we need, to, I don't think so, we need more managers. Uh, I think we need more specialists as a need of the art. Very true. So that's my the managers will become transactional. Yes, yes, yes. That's From trans transactional. And the tacit dimension, the last one of the T's, is where you see this explosion. And, and it is happening. If you look at venture capital, if you look at private equity, where is it going? It's going into little ventures. Hairdressing, somebody looked up Fat Mo, a friend of mine, a lady friend of mine. Someone looked up Fat Mo on her laptop, or his laptop. I think it is here, or it is in home. And he said, yes, I know Fat Mo. Fashion and technology make up. The two English girls, they lived in India for a long time, and with the Indian partner, they had a school of 900 Girls. Tribal girls, largely, girls from the poorer sections who now work in Hollywood. Hollywood, sorry. It's vocational training. It's, I mean, where did the idea come from? I don't know. So, it's exactly what you said. Yes, thank you. To build that entrepreneurship, somehow the MBA schools don't do it. I don't know why. just doesn't happen. Not all, some do, some do, but not as much. I'll take, for example, our own service, TAS, and I know Anil has a different view on it. The young TAS boys and girls who want to come in, want to come in as EA to the chairman, EA to the MD, EA to the VP, an extension of their campus life. Very few of them will say, like all of us were pushed into, go and make that iron ore and mine. Make it work. Just go and do something which is real, which is very different, and use your skills. And if you need help, ask. You just ask for help. Yeah. Sometimes it's very surprising to me. Like uh, on national level, we have uh, advertisements like um, get to the Navy, get to Air Force, yeah, become this. Why are there no such things? Uh, entrepreneurship as an alternative career. There is. You have to search the papers. Yeah. There is various views in that, but how uh, how much impact they, they are from? separating it from the MBA. Yes, the so school being separated. So soil can play an important role. Huge, absolutely. In fact, that is, in my view, that's a fundamental role because you build multifaceted, multi-dimensional people who can be in NGOs, government, anyway. It doesn't matter. Again, they are domain neutral. But leadership specific, value specific. Sorry. Stanford has a course in social entrepreneurship. I think about Stanford has a course in Professor Sue, H S E I. He's, he's the last word on the subject. Yeah. Uh, so we were just talking about. Uh, so we were just talking about the managers, like uh, uh, how uh, managers are not more any more needed. But not don't needed. you? Yeah. Think, uh, yeah, uh, the way I, as you were saying, the role of a teacher is now uh, more than uh, more than a teacher. It is like a facilitator. So, don't you think the uh, place of a manager will remain as a facilitator for more, rather than acting himself? Because what will happen when a lot of people are there who are tech, not, tech savvy and all? The thing is, uh, manager will have a lot more dependency on those guys. At that point of time, he will not, he himself will not have the. Uh, the tax savvy guy will not have the direction to go and again the manager as we are supposing him to be, he will not have knowledge to get it uh, in the right direction. So, do you, do you, don't you think like manager's role will be uh, 
as important as a tech savvy guy or or a technology uh, who, the, the guy. The role will be important, but the dimension of the role will change. It will be multifaceted, and it won't remain constant over a period of time. For a sales manager selling chocolates in 2013, as we speak, the sales manager who sells chocolates in maybe 30, 20, 23 will be very different. Will be made. a very different skill. Yes, the managers will be there. They have to manage. But it's the the skills will change, the hierarchies will change. We we become slowly less hierarchical, but more demanding. And the accountability platforms will come lower and lower to near the code base. I'll give you an example from Afcon, where I'm still on the board. We've done away with the whole category of site supervisor. What's a supervisor? You're doing the work, I'm supervising you. What value am I? If you can do the work, I'm not needed. So all you do is empower him with a laptop and a project management system, where if he needs help, he can press the button. 400 supervisors not needed. That can do something else. Sites in Madagascar, Liberia, Jordan, India, up in the Himalayas. This is the change which is coming. And fortunately, the younger generation are very eager to adapt this change. But it's the institutions which also need to push for even more. In a sense, the student becomes the teacher. And uh, coming to the uh, culture, what Soil was uh, propagating, um, what I think is like the culture, the kind of culture what Soil is propagating, it is uh, more like a person should ha should have a holistic view of the business. But oh, what I think of late, there is. <laughs> something uh, i don't i don't uh, say that uh, uh, probably the students are not getting it what soil like exactly wants to propagate so a lot of us still are in that mode that we want the placement we want the placement so how to come out of that thing i don't think if we don't 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 come out of that mode uh, the so teaching of soil will be help much 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 more helpful this is your session ask your friends to answer that. Yeah. there's somebody I, at the back coach He's almost falling asleep. Who wants the mic? Yes, you. <laughs> no, I think that's a joke. I just, uh, like we all discussed about entrepreneurship here, and since we are having a new campus in Pune, which is about 15 acres, I have an idea that why can't we have, uh, let's say, entrepreneurship cell? Because I don't think any B school right now take all those ideas. Uh, to the cell and facilitate them, but take some of them, scrutinize them. Look at that campus. Look at that campus. Okay. <coughs> Partly the answer to that. Partly there are answers now in private equity. It's called Venture America. Yes. Look up that. This is exactly in the same space that you're talking about. People who have been successful entrepreneurs coach people who want to come into that space and take an interest in their firm value-based interest. This is happening, and it will happen more and more. Because you don't need size in order to be successful. In our time, you needed size. You don't need size now, you need brain power. Same thing, yes, absolutely. But how to teach that? Difficult. It, sort of, it just happens. Similarly, like teaching leadership is also difficult, but we have managed to pull that off pretty well. So I guess... Uh, then why is there a shortage of leaders? Every company, you ask them, what's your problem? There's a shortage of leaders. Any problem, any company, anywhere in the world. Unilever, you ask anybody. Shortage of leaders. And yet, every book is written on the subject, every airport shelf is filled with it. Why is there a perpetual shortage of leadership? I think then it boils down to these five pillars, which are actually very uh, helpful in making successful leaders, I must say. So some time back, uh, the in word in the industry was uh, leadership, but now it has uh, changed to effective strategies. So uh, effective. effective strategies, uh, and uh, with these uh, values which are which are being inculcated in us, in all the soil students, in each one of us, uh, this will not only help us become good leaders, obviously, but also help us uh, make effective decisions and effective problem effective solving. Strategy. So uh, that will obviously make us at par 
uh, with all the other EP schools. But you want to be at power, then you're left them behind. You don't want to be at power. <clears throat> it's not the question of catching up with the B schools. It's meeting the needs of tomorrow's change agents. The B school will have to catch up with you. If they do, they'll have to have a huge change in their structure too. But effective strategies mean those which succeed. And again, if you look at many classes on strategy, I'm sorry to say 30 to 40 percent of them are tactical. They mistake tactics for strategy. What's your strategy? I lower my price. I lighten the product. This is not strategy. It need not be long term, it be short term too. Strategy's simple definition of strategy is that which has not been done before for a purpose. That's it. That is, we mean Michael Porter, you read anybody, but a lot of work on strategy, sadly, to be taught in these schools, is tactical, refined tactics, and is put down as the strategic pathway, the strategic journey. It's not. Strategy is very, very different. It's something you have not done before, by definition, for a purpose, with high risk. Um, I'm not very sure how this is relevant to uh, what we're discussing right Doesn't now. Matter. Uh, there's this um, company called Kumon India Limited. Kumon. It's a Japanese company. Uh, it's basically into the education sector. Um, K U N. Kumon. Kumon. So uh, what they really do is uh, the education system is not like ours. It's more or it's for the children as of now. Uh, what they do is, they, they have an induction, like we have in our college, where they go through the entire um, personality of the child and uh, they have their own set of measuring their uh, EQ level, IQ level. And then accordingly, they have these worksheets. And every student has to do that worksheet in a certain time limit. And it's more of a self-learning process. Yeah, I know. And uh, they'll have to keep doing the worksheet unless and until they get a 100 on 100 in that worksheet. Only then will they get the next set. Yeah. So, um, exactly what you mean. so what is really, what I'm just suggesting a small thing that we can do, uh, which might just lessen, uh, reduce the gap. If we, we have quizzes and we have all those things, so if they're getting a 3 point, even in a small quiz, out of 5 marks, they're getting a 3.5, why aren't we told to do it again, so that I can actually get a 5 and 5 for everybody? Maybe that will just... I can't answer. I know this method, I have a, a grand nephew. Mother has just flown from San, 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 San Francisco and he stayed with me in Bombay. The mother's gone off shopping all over the place. And she's asked me to do this very thing with him until he can visually see the numbers and instinctively get it right. They learn music the same way, the Suzuki school. Even the, even the listening is taught to them in the same way. Different methods of teaching. I don't, know, I don't have the skills to comment on that. Perhaps Sharendraji, would you like to? So that, as whether that's the way to go, I really don't know. It's very hard. It's with the Japanese. It's very common, especially with learning music and kids all over the San Francisco Bay Area. They have this. I I, I didn't know the name was this, but to me it's a bit unnerving. But then Japanese kids are smart. They're smart. But yet, if you look at it. Where are the Japanese software firms which are leaders in the world? What innovation takes place in Japan, which is world or ground shutting hasn't yet taken place? They're highly efficient people. I used to be on the board of FANUK, the robotics giant. And we used to go to Japan three, four times a year and, and sit at board meetings. It would go like clockwork. But I don't know whether that's a better way. I really don't know. But it works in Japan and Korea. Partly in Singapore too. It's creeping in.
need to be taught again at a grassroots level. But that, and if you go to the West, if uh, any of your family members you have in England or Australia, <coughs> the husband cooks, yes, <laughs> changes the pots to run the washing machine, cleans the car. My brother is there, he's been there since 1950s. He yeah, but they're hands on, but they. The hands on not always. It seems like if the work has to be done, you cannot yeah. wait for a specialist but to come. But minimize that by keeping their lives simple and free of clutter. We clutter our lives with things, objects. If you free yourself of that, you'll have a lot more time, less to maintain. But that's a way of thinking. You need that open space. You need that emptiness. Then that sense of wonder, the creativity, all fills, because nature abhors a vacuum. But yes, it need not be an extreme to that end also. But there it has to be there somewhere in the mindset. Because as of now, there is a a lot of uh, you know shortage of plumbers, electricians. You wait for. I know. So why why it is happening? Even for simple things. Yeah. It's just the mindset which needs to be. You may not be an you know, electrician as of as a designation, but the mindset. I had a boss. It's impossible. Uh, he used to come into my room. He would never knock on the door, and the door was open generally. And he'd find me reading poetry, literature. Uh, you know, and he would say, but you're never working, and I said, but look at my results, I've met my budgets, I've met my targets. What does it matter if my desk is clear? So then I learned, I had a nice secretary, she put empty newspapers on the desk, and all made it look as if he's been very, very busy, and behind that I'd be reading poetry instead. You have to have that, you, if you lose that, I think you pay for it later on. We see people who have worked all their lives and their retirement has come, don't know what to do. They become bogies. Anyway, I must really rush. I have a question for you. How, uh, do you have this age in 1965? 78. <laughs> so, wow, I wish I was 65. <laughs> so, how do you maintain this constant effort to upgrade yourself in whatever you need? That upgrade. sense of, uh, the sense of curiosity. Ask Shailendra Jay to feed you with mawa. <laughs> No, I think my mind is young because uh, I was very lucky. I had a wife who passed away. But uh, she would never let me feel that I'm a husband. Um, we were always friends. And in fact, we were married in a very strange way. Uh, my, we had a large house in Bombay, old house. <coughs> One Monday at the, the house servant came and said, Sir, this is our night. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, I'm in my part of the house having fun, smoking and all the rest of it. So I go there and my dad says, what's this I hear? You don't want to get married to so-and-so. And I said, yeah, no. But she wants to get married to you. She's complained to your mom. Your mom has complained to me. Now her father's birthday is on the 3rd of February. You will get married on the 3rd of February. It's about being legend. I said, Dad, I'm out going out with Sita, Gita, and Rita. Where am I got time? He said, that's your word. End of story. So, you know, when you have that sort of a relationship that someone is bold enough to say, you know, you will marry me because it's the best thing that can happen to you, then you grow up in a very free environment. And you sort of just are friends. This husband, wife, brother, sister, all these terms are restrictive in it. Anyway, <laughs> Thank you. Honorable Board Member Mr. Prodi, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a word of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of Student Fraternity, and here together on my own behalf, extend a hearty word of thanks to you, sir, for your praising your important work, time, and sharing us your findings and opinions with us. We are inspired by your words, sir. Thank you.